How are you, Mariana? By the way, I haven't even said good day to you yet. Yeah, good, good, good. How are you? Good, 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 good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Except the Oak Barrel's just gone live with Matt Bailey, so we've got to jump in and fix that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't have a chance to update the titles. Yeah, so. no, that's right. I'll, I'll jump okay. in there now. Yep. <laughs> We're live, folks. Hello, everyone, by the way. Hello. Um, I do apologize. My yeah. fault. Technical issues. That's okay. Boris, this things happen. Boris got his belt. Oh, shit. What have I done? I didn't do anything. I'm yeah. sure of that because I actually didn't do anything. So. Yeah. <laughs> because I wouldn't let you do anything. That was the problem. I, uh, I literally just joined. <laughs> Don't blame it on me. Um, well, uh, Marietta, how are you? Uh, I couldn't hear anything before, so how's things? <laughs> Good, good, uh, all good. Uh, we're still up in Scotland today. I'm in the office. That's why I have this, uh, this beautiful view in the background. Uh, so I'm up in Stirling. Uh, Scotland is still in lockdown. So this is my only chance to get out of the house, which is great because I come to mm. an office full of whiskey anyway. I still need to do the work, but, you know, it's better than anything, better than nothing. What about you? Yeah, very well, very well. All the bars are open again. Uh, so... Woo. I think that we've done a pretty good job here in Australia of, um, of getting through this. So, um, yeah, this we just need to make sure that this. Are you are you saying that we're not doing a good job up here? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I'm not going to be the. You know, I haven't been saying anything. You might be doing a good job as well. All I know is Australia, and New Zealand is doing an exceptional job. Well done, both of you. I'm jealous. Yeah. Yeah, to, to, to the fact where there's actually a time limit on this because the Wild Rover is open tonight uh, for the first time in three months. So we need to get there before it closes at some point. So we've got about four hours before that happens. But I have, it is on the clock. Yeah, I forgot that it's uh, nighttime. Wait, I'll, yeah, is it 8 30 now? Where you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we can, we can yeah. talk for a while before, um, before uh, uh, Scotty gets so text run. message from. Uh, just yeah. to, tell, to tell them that we, you got to get in before the, the we get locked out. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I tell you what, it has we'll been. Yeah, yeah, two two hours. Actually, that will have to be fast with the amount of shit I can talk. Um, it has actually been excellent though. To I know that you know the three of us have, have got out and had a, like a couple of dinners and had a few drinks together. It's actually been great mm. to see like just bars and venues and just like. You, you're like you, you're in your little groups, and often you're told where to sit, and that's that's fine. But like just yelling over the bar to someone um, to the table three and a half meters away, uh, it's been it's been very good. Um, and who would have thought that my happiness is intrinsically tied to access to good bars and boozers? So I'm in a really good mood. Did you just discover it like uh, <laughs> just casually? So well. I just discovered that my happiness is related to takeaway food, and I didn't know this. I, I only discovered. That. Trust me. I'm like doing lockdown in the middle of nowhere in a beautiful part of Scotland, like in the East Coast uh, border. So it's beautiful, you know, like the beach is amazing, much better weather than Glasgow. I mean, that's not hard, but still, but yeah. a beautiful, you know, beautiful part of the world. And God, do I miss like a pizza and some, you know, filthy Chinese, you know, food or Indian food or some, you know, tasty dripping burgers. Yeah. I'm dreaming of that right now. I don't know why. I just discovered that after three months. There's a side well, of me. I remember last time we caught up, Mary, and, and it was in Sydney, and we went to, um, uh, we went to that across the road from Baxter's. My brain's fried at the moment. Uh, Duke of Clarence. Duke of Clarence. <clears throat> and you ordered, you ordered the pork knuckle, and like we all ordered like sort of standard sized dishes, and this pork knuckle that was bigger than my head turned up, and uh, yeah, you demolished it. It was you did a, you did a well, well job of that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I do love. I mean, I obviously miss going to bars like a lot, but yeah. uh, man, I do miss going to restaurants like massively as well. Or just grabbing food that is not been cooked by me because I love cooking. But after three months, yeah, it's just nice to get it delivered to your door right in front. Yeah, first world problems. I'm such a horrible person. <laughs> anyway, first world problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> horrible, horrible. But yeah, yeah, cool. So are bars already now open? Like, can you already go to bars, or do you need to? I imagine you still need to social distance. Do you have to reserve yeah. tables and stuff like that? <clears throat> yeah, there's this various sort of caveats and limits. So, um, and it's different in each state as well. So, uh, Victoria is still pretty limited. We've gone up to 50, a maximum of 50, but the maximum group size is 10. And you have to be, I think it's four square meters per person. So, depending on your venue size. But once you're in the venue, Technically, there's no rule that says you have to sit a meter and a half from the other person. Right. Um, 
the tables have to be a meter half apart. So yeah, we've we've got various caveats cool. and rules across the place, um, but yeah. plenty of plenty of scope to get amongst it and, and get drinking, nice. which is good. I hope it will happen here soon as well, so that we can go back to a, a decent, uh, normal life. Yeah. Mm. Um, so everyone who's jumping in on the on the live streams, I do apologise for the false start before. Uh, I don't know how far uh, Matt and Andy uh, and then Mariana got uh, into that, but I feel like we should do some some quick introductions. Obviously, um, the three of us are relatively well known to the to the various pages, but uh, and Mariana to um, anyone who came to the Aaron tasting uh, in the Oak Barrel Room, what feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I couldn't even tell you whether it was this year or last year at the moment, but it was. In a, in, a, in a pre-COVID world, which which was excellent. Your name's on the wall. Um, uh, obviously, the, the brand ambassador for, for Aaron uh, Whiskey, but also has had jobs in the world that tie into both what uh, Matt has, has or is doing now and what Andy's done in the past. Mm. Do you want to maybe take take everyone through exactly what you've done and, and like, your, your whiskey journey to here? Um, and then I reckon we should go around and see what everyone's drinking while I find myself a glass. Yeah, so, um, um, yeah, so I started six, seven years ago now. Every year the number rises, it's insane. And <laughs> I moved to London uh, seven years ago. Yeah, God. And um, I just, you know, classic. I come from a tiny little town in southern Italy. I left uni, left my boyfriend, left the family. I was like, yeah, I need to try and find something else to do in life. And I went to London because my cousin was actually living there. So she helped me out finding a place and then uh, I found a job obviously in a bar, classic, you know, uh, classic Italian uh, job when you move to London. Uh, but then I discovered whiskey uh, just by, um, yeah, just by luck. I tried a few whiskeys in the bar that I was working in and I fell in love straight away and I don't know what, just, you know, magic happens and I discovered this new passion. So I tried to look for um, a job and London, you know, was obviously is an amazing place if you're looking you know to uh, build a career in the whiskey industry i was very lucky at the whiskey exchange shop in venopolis that actually uh, the specific one that i used to work at doesn't exist anymore uh, i started working there in the shop and then i go from a part-time job to a full-time job and then you know my eyes got open and i started to learn how things worked that's how i met um, andy so we definitely we were met there because i think at the time you were uh, were you events manager at the time already? I don't remember. If no, you... so I was I was actually still working in wine next door. Um, oh. When you joined. Mm. Um, oh, so we must have joined roughly at the same time, the company. Then. Yeah, yeah. Like you so must we... have joined right after because I definitely remember you uh, coming to the tastings as well. So, uh, so, yeah, and I worked in the shop for a year and then after a year I decided to become a brand ambassador because I really liked the... Um, Mostly the traveling part. I really like traveling, so I, you know, I wanted a job that allowed me to move around um, a lot, and also just, you know, using my, um, you know, my passion to talk to people. So, you know, uh, I thought it was a perfect fit. So I moved from the whiskey exchange shop to the Scotchman Whiskey Society in Farringdon, in London, which is like a smaller venue, and I worked as a you know bar person and also a brand ambassador when they were doing the tastings inside the venue or outside the venue, and I absolutely loved it because obviously you get access. I got access to amazing liquid right from the start. If you go to the whiskey exchange, they have you know secret cupboards with amazing stuff in there. But the Scotchman Whiskey Society kind of like put it on another level because you were playing like you know with casks and you had at least 20 to try every month so it was like heaven really and you got to discover so many distilleries that maybe most people wouldn't even know about or wouldn't even mention they were just releasing some amazing amazing stuff uh, just because you know that cask was so phenomenal and i have to say i was also lucky because both i joined the whiskey exchange and the scotch whiskey society at a perfect time where you could still access very good liquid for very good price yeah. Yeah, I remember was, one of the, the glory <laughs> years. Is, is days, joyous. You know. I, I remember the very first, it was actually before I joined uh, Whiskey Exchange, but it was, it was the end of the whiskey show, and we were just sitting there helping clear up, swigging Talisker 25 from a bottle. Um, it just was, I think someone had just gone, oh, do, do you want the rest of that? 
I so, remember clearly people coming in asking, yeah, this was very early stages, but people were still coming in with the Jim Morris whiskey Bible, you know, like mm -hmm. looking at the whiskeys and reading. And I was like, oh, no, like, why, why? And then I was like, I'm looking at a Japanese whiskey, you know, something around, you know, 40, 50 pounds. Oh, we had this Karizawa Spirit of Asama, which is, you know, just very nice and easy. And man, we were so, I was so naive back then. It was so <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yoichi, like, and Takatsuru 17, just on the shelf looking at at you so you know just relaxed and I was like god if I, if I only knew you know that whiskey was amazing anyway same goes for SNWS I remember my first one of my favorite whiskeys ever which I actually only finished uh, uh, a couple of months ago when I moved in with my boyfriend as a celebration I had the very last drops I almost cried it was a like Leash 1984 uh, refill sherry but it was very clear so it was very old sherry it was just it's called say it with flowers it was possibly one of the best whiskey I've ever tried in my life it was just so orchardy flowery waxy beautifully just good stuff and I remember paying something like 90 pounds for it at the time <laughs> yeah. for, for mid 90s pine leash like yeah okay yeah I know right like a pound you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's absurd, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. it has changed a lot, though, in, in a short amount of time, I, I guess, in some ways. it's. I mean, the yeah. demand on older stocks, of course, is, as we've all seen, is is absurd. And, yeah. and you can't cheat that aging process. And it's it's constantly, um, uh, yeah, it's always changing. Um, uh, can, I, can I just actually, whilst just interrupt you for, whilst I've interrupted for a second, Andy Davis on the comments stream, there's heaps of comments coming in, which is great, has said, um, hello to Mariella. Uh, you guys are doing such a great job just took delivery of my Aaron master of distilling 12 year old yet to open but if it's as good as the Laird's quake last year I'll be a very happy drama must be a great feedback like that that is a beautiful drama actually especially if you like um, a bit of like old school mustiness I don't know if you can say that like you know like Dunnage Warehouse you know musty mm. wet wood I never know how to say it in a nice way because if you say those things to me I think oh that's tasty but some other people may think you know that it's a bit weird <laughs> uh, but uh, because the whiskey was finished that whiskey's finished in uh, Solera um, Palo Cortado from 1964 so it gives it this you know very yeah just very old school feeling to it. it's like very quincy and lightly jammy and fruity but like old school it's almost like if it was mixed with a blend from like the 80s or something if you know what i mean you know yeah. what i mean yeah yeah i know am i just talking horrible stuff? <laughs> no, no, i get it i get it good <laughs> anyway so yeah uh moving on i then um got back to the whiskey exchange but for elixir distillers so i worked as a, a brand ambassador for them and that was great because he actually showed me really what a brand ambassador job you know was and what i needed to do and what i needed to learn so there was a great opportunity to do an amazing liquid like if you know elixir distillers and the single casks that they do and even just like the stuff that they just put out it was nice like it was very nice like very very good <laughs> very good liquid and then I took a year off um, and I went traveling for a while. And then I went to spend some time with mom and dad in Italy and enjoy summer and get fat and tanned. And then I got back into the whiskey world and I finally got my dream job. And I work as a global brand ambassador for Iron Distillers. So it's amazing. It's uh, what I always wanted. So it's, uh, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, amazing. So you've been busy then? God. <laughs> Yeah, since lockdown has happened, that uh, we're organizing a lot of virtual, you know, events, and um, obviously, as I can't travel anywhere, I'm, you know, trying to work very hard on those sort of things. So we're doing Sunday club events. Uh, I'm helping with the social media side of things. So I'm learning more on the marketing side now, which is very cool, especially for you know future jobs and future opportunities. And uh, we're working very hard for the festival. That's why I'm here in the office because I have to prepare 40 boxes with two samples each and get them all you know, <laughs> labeled and put in place and then send them all away. So that's, what, that's my job for the day here today. Can I ask a question just on that? I know it's something that Matt and myself have spoken about, obviously running a lot of physical events up until, bang, a day when you can't run any anymore. I think a lot of this stuff that we've been doing is actually stuff that we probably should have been doing before global pandemics anyway. For, from a distillery's point of view, have you, you know, like opportunities like this, for you know, for example, it's a little bit cheaper than flying all the way to Sydney and Melbourne and doing a tour, you know, when you can just organise the thing. Is there anything that you have as a distillery have sort of noticed in particular an idea that's come up that go, you go, oh, we're going to keep doing this. We probably should have been doing it already. 
Um, I mean, apart from what would, what is very useful and what a lot of people are asking for are virtual tours. So more than like, yes, people do want tastings, you know, and they're, they, they're ready to pay, especially in the UK, tastings at the moment have been very, very popular because obviously people can go to, you know, to see their friends yeah. to have a tasting. <clears throat> so those are becoming very popular, but I think when the lockdown is over, um, people still want to, you know, see their mates and see their friends, you know, in real life, because the real life experience is definitely different from, you know, the virtual one. Uh, but as I said before, I think tours of the distillery, the fact that people can access our distillery and see it, you know, with their own eyes and learn what we're doing uh, just by a video, for example, um, it's, uh, it's much, you know, very appreciated. And unfortunately, we do have some issues because at the moment uh, we are actually, our visitor center is closed and we only started uh, the production again a few weeks ago. So we're slowly, you know, catching up. But uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of distilleries that were just literally with the phone going, this is our distillery, we're doing this. And people absolutely loved that. Like, uh, it was great. Same thing with chats with master distillers and um Distillery managers, blenders, people really are really, really loving that. But obviously, in, we've definitely seen a spike, a massive spike on social media compared to last year, compared to the previous month, because now a lot of people are just, you know, greedy, not greedy, but like they're craving, you know, whiskey information and whiskey activities. Mm -hmm. So our social media has been, you know, very, very active and, you know, much more engagement uh, than the last, the, the last months. Scotty and I did talk about this at length a, a few times about would we be doing these after all and, and should we have been doing them before? And it's it's funny, he mentions that I did three virtual, just three, last year for the whole year. And they were and they were two of them were in Scotland and one of them was in Australia. And uh, after this, the second Scotland one was actually broadcast from Campbelltown, from uh, Archill nice. Hotel, and it was a total disaster. Uh, it, it was the, the the signal strength. It was like the, it was like it was like a, a forty minutes ago for us here. The, the signal strength went was all haywire, disconnection problems, audio dropping out, screen dropping out, and we finished the tasting after about ninety minutes of just nightmares and going. Well, let's not do that again. So it's, it's yeah. you know how you learn from these experiences, and it's like but we've all each of us here have hosted events in person. At the end of the event, you've gone. Oh, let's not do that again. You know, and, and it's, I mean, we have, it's true. Like you've, you've done yeah. events where you've gone, that didn't go as planned. That was kind yeah. of annoying. That I'm, crowd I'm, glad, yeah. I'm glad the society stood us corporate gigs so I don't have to. <laughs> That's your first and last dig. That is, oh mate. Some of those level 20 gigs in, in the center of town, never again, never again. <laughs> no, they're pretty good fun. I'm not worried no, about that. No, 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 you're missing the point. No, I'm just saying that there's, there's yeah, there's, there's certainly events that we, I've done uh, you know, even pre-society where I've gone, uh, that, that didn't work. And it's, I think it's just, uh, you have to apply the same logic and preparation to an online event as you do an in-person one. So, yeah. Yeah. I have to say maybe, uh, I don't know if it's a popular opinion or not, but I don't, I've been, I'm trying to get on tastings myself because I'm home, you know, and, you know, I'm like, I wouldn't mind going and seeing someone else, you know, telling me something about whiskey and receiving a lovely box set, you know, with some delicious stuff to do. But God, everything is selling out like so quickly. Like I'm, I'm using, I was getting in touch with the Good Spirits Company, which is a whiskey and spirits and wine and beer shop in Glasgow. And uh, they're doing a rum tasting. And I thought, oh, yeah, it's getting, you know, it's that tickets are starting to get sold today. So I'm going to get in touch and get two tickets. So then me and my brother that lives in Manchester can do the same thing virtually. And they sold out in like seconds. And I was like, how is it possible? You know, that so many people are need, you know, so many people want these sort of tastings. But I still think that a live tasting with, you know, people that are in the same room is much better than a virtual one. But then again, you'll know, you don't know what's going to happen in the future if this pandemic, you know, is going to change the world forever. So mm. as long as, you know, we're ready to adapt, I would say. But I definitely want my job back and I want to be able to travel again. So thank you for that. <laughs> but, th but that's an interesting point because when we were looking at doing virtual tastings here, here in the back room, uh, about, about this time last year, it was about the fact that we were selling 44 tickets and how do we sell more? So, okay, like we, we've used one bottle, we physically can't, you know, fit any more in. How can we do both? Um, and it came down to the fact that when I host, I walk around too much uh, for one still camera and I refuse to wear a Madonna mic. So it oh, sort of went in the bin. What's wrong with so, a Madonna mic? Oh, the, the hint's in the name. 
But so you, you, want, you was, want one of the air pieces that goes down. You know, give me give me a handheld. That's what I like. Um, <laughs> but but like that's interesting, like because I think the the virtual tastings that we'll continue to do will be things that won't sell out. You know, that we can sell as many of as as possible, so that people who can't make it into town on a Wednesday night can also um, do it. So it's an interesting. That that they are selling out. It's a different approach. If you analyze the tastings themselves as well, I was thinking about it the other day. If I were to do a tasting with like 20, 40 people that I never met before, I, you know, and I want to make a silly, stupid joke. I wouldn't, you know, it's also people that, it depends how you set up the tasting too. I've done tastings for whiskey clubs where everyone was in and then everyone could say all the jokes that they wanted and everyone could interrupt anyone that sometimes could be annoying, sometimes could be good. But if you're just doing a tasting where people just send in because they want to know something, I think it's also a little bit, you know, cold and uh, I don't know, maybe it's me. I don't say that, I'm not saying the ritual is bad, but I'm just saying, it's, it's yeah, harder I, mean, to read. I need someone, yeah. I need someone it's to ask to read the question to engage. Yeah, to you, 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 you pick out people as you go and you just sort of go, right, I'm going to rely on you to, to yeah. sort of, you just, you, Especially you our distillery, exactly, that focuses so much on, you know, our main focus is to bring people to our, like we want them to come to the island and visit our place. You, you can try and do that virtually, but, you know, nothing compares to getting the ferry over, you know, arriving in Brodick, looking at stags, you know, having cheese, beer and whiskey all together and having the whole experience. You can do that virtually, but, you know, I still hope that hopefully in the future we'll get back to, you know, bringing people into the distillery, like, you know, for real and showing them, you know, with their own eyes. It is, it is a very different skill set. And I've noticed, uh, particularly in some of the bigger companies, the, you know, the multinationals, when all this hit, you know, you could tell a lot of the BAs and, and people around the country were told, you need to run a nightly live tasting and, and that sort of thing. And all these people who can read a room really well, can talk to bartenders, you know, on their language, walk into any bar, read a room and go, okay, I need to not be here right now. Well, this is the right time. <laughs> the idea of sitting alone in your home, in your lounge room, talking at a camera, only seeing you and trying to keep that energy and, you know, keep engaging, it's mm. a completely different skill set. Like most of them, like... The, the ones that I'm watching now are a million times better than they were three months ago. But it's yeah. been quite quite interesting to see those people just like evolve or like hit the ground running and just have to, to run with it. Yeah. And those who have we well, for that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a very different skill to present in that way where you're you're performing and then kind of yeah, that's it. I also feel, you also feel pretty you feel very drained after like when you do like stuff trainings things that you actually, you're trying to engage so much virtually by just making jokes or you know yeah. just <clears throat> but sometimes so many times I ask questions and all I get is just silence and you're like <laughs> okay moving on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, and, and you know it, even enough. when like when I, from the opposite point of view from the consumer or the, the taster or the, the bartender whoever it is sometimes you can. You, you sort of you're just one of x however many and often you don't know how many are, are listening and you, you don't want to really just i guess like putting your hand up and asking what you think is going to be a, a stupid question in a room you don't want to yeah. you know ask us to be pointed out to a million people or to 10 people whoever's watching mm. uh, and i think often you know sometimes you can feel less engaged because you don't feel like that person is talking directly to you so you sometimes yeah. you're you're watching a tv show and they're talking to someone else rather than being in the same room but yeah so it's I've actually found it quite, 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 uh, quite fascinating, quite fascinating um, to see how that's rolled out in the past couple of months. But I really think it it should continue. You know, I, I think the the audience reach is is the massive thing. So, I, the chats I've had is you know, Victoria especially. You know, it's if a lot of the, all the tastings happen in CBD, and if you're out in the burbs or a bit further out. You're, you're a long way to get in and get out just for an event. So it's, you know, <clears throat> most people that do, <clears throat> you're committing to a night, you know, overnight stay. So you come and you've got oh, dinner, oh, you've yeah. got hotel, you've got yeah. your tickets to the event. So a $30, $40, $50 tasting suddenly becomes $200 per head. And it's that, uh, well, actually, that's, that's a big commitment. And, yeah, you know, the, from what I'm hearing from a lot, it's you know, people who aren't close to, to these locations for these tastings, all of a sudden you can go, no, I can start doing and attending all these events. And it is affordable to me and, you know, it's not <clears throat> requiring hours of travel to get to and from, which I think it's probably less so in the UK because it's so much more compact and, and so much 
that's the retailers throughout the breadth of the country. But it was yeah, a lot of country members in the, a lot of country and rural members of the society who bought the packs, the last few packs we've done. And I yeah. mean, a lot of city members bought them as well, but it was like a lot of members who live quite far out or don't see as many society events that came that booked into our last mo- our most recent one. It's, it's a really good point, um, and, you know, because obviously even if you're, you're Sydney and you can't make it, it becomes a $200 night, but if you're regional, it can be a four or $500 night. And like imagine spending four or $500 to a tasting and then getting there and having to listen to Matt Bailey for an hour and a half. Man. You'd want your money back, right? You know, you'd be calling the bus lines, you'd be calling the hotel, you'd be like, <laughs> give me all my money back. So I, I totally get it. 100%. <laughs> Such confidence. <laughs> Such confidence. <laughs> <laughs> As if you don't know that by now, I just do it dry with a punchline coming out. It's been, it's been three months. You know how this works. <laughs> uh, years of grilling. I should have. I should have picked it up by now. It's okay. It's okay. I have a thick skin, Scotty. It's fine. <laughs> right. I know it's all going to come back in one horrific night somewhere. Oh, in it's going to hurt. Don't worry. I may not survive it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm warning you now. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I don't know what, what time it is where you are, Mariel, is it what, midday-ish now or no, not quite? Yeah, really? yeah, 10 to 12, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. yeah uh, so um, are, you, are you, is it a bit early? Probably it's not quite midday yet, but I think I wouldn't mind uh, hearing what Matt and Andy are drinking at the moment. Well, I mean, I started with, uh, I started being quite, like I said, on brand for, for Mary's uh, appearance. Uh, so I, I picked out a Aaron quarter cask and she asked initially on the, on the, on the broken stream, what that little uh, gold emblem on the bottle is. And I said, well, that's the society monogram because I stuck it on there because I'm just being a cheeky bugger. And I just, I rebranded the bottle on you top just, and bottom. You do- so, um, and then so and, I, know, I, just, I couldn't help myself. And then I, I found, I found a, uh, in, in the back of my cupboard, a 121, which is a, um, from a distillery also called uh, something similar. So it's, I can't tell you what distillery it is, as you know, but it's 121. Uh-huh. So I thought I might open that one um, or, Stick with the quarter cask, so there you go. Nice. Quarter cask is my favorite out of the range, so well done there. It's, I, I love, like it. absolutely well, love that drum. You know, I like, you know, I like high proof spirit, so it's, it's good fun. Yeah, nice and fruity. Yeah, absolutely. Andy? I, I thought I had some Aaron, but I've clearly drunk it all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I looked, I looked to another island instead, <clears throat> um, and in my joy of attacking the miniatures that I've got to drink, I thought I was going to be woefully disappointed with this little guy. Oh, cool. Um, Where'd you get that from? That's very cool. <clears throat> uh, whiskey auction. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I, you know, there's 90s Jura, 80s Jura, uh, yeah, 90s to early 2000s Jura. I was never a fan of. I found it chewy, clunky, uh, a bit rubbery. Um, I've tried a lot of the recent stuff. Um, at duty free and stuff um, that Greg Glass is now working on, and that is super. Like you can tell, everything he's done at Compass Box is just actually the, the quality should be coming back there, which is good. But yeah, this is, this must be seventies, I would guess. There, there was a very similar looking label, um, Dura bottling, that I was uh, very um, humbled to be able to share. Share, which was uh, a friend of mine had a bottle of this. It said Dura. I think 10 or 12 or something on the bottle and it had like a deer on the, and it had a very similar look to that yeah. shape, to that, um, that label. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's the old school style. Of yeah. And, it, they've had, but. and down the bottom, it said um, distilled by Mickey heads on, oh, on the bottle. Sure. Which I thought was very cool. So it's obviously pre I'd beg Mickey heads days of Jura mm. kind of bottling. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's rather cool. So it's like eighties. Uh, I'm going to get my timelines wrong, no doubt, but I thought it was cool to see something that was distilled by the now outgoing head distiller from mm. I'd beg. Yeah. I reckon they've turned a corner. Um, you know, the, there's probably a little bit of work to be done in, in the in the official bottlings. There's, a, there's a, a couple that I still find a little bit clumsy, a little bit tripping over themselves. Mm. But, but there's been some of like the indie stuff coming out um, and like some of the AB stuff from the new range from two or three years ago is some of the best I've tried in the past, you know, Five, six, seven years, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely, there was definitely a, a lull period and then a good pickup. It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was ready to be very woefully disappointed and I'm, I'm not, so I'm happy. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I have to think about that when it comes to distilleries that have turned a corner, that have come around and, and really like where, where their range has, I think, vastly improved over the years. And yeah, I mean, I think Bamor's another one for me. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and not not saying the other stuff was bad. It's just you know, it's turned a corner. It's yeah, changed. yeah. And like not, every, you know, not everyone likes Palmer violets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you know, maybe sometimes there's an element of um, you know distilleries trading on reputations a little bit. Um, I think Highland Park was another one for that. Some of the um, the, the the Valkyrie Valfather Val whatever series. Mm. There's been some of the better ones. Mm. Um, a couple of quick shout outs just on the on the Facebook live stream here. Um, Stefan Van Ecken, who is my go to authority for uh, Japanese hey. whiskey whenever I have a question. Good to you. And speaking of which, I have a very, very special Aaron in my collection, uh, which is very, very prized possession of, of mine that I, uh, I do thank Stefan for, um, which those in the know might know what single cast that is. So um, I'm waiting for him to come back to Australia when this is all over so we can crack it together at some point. Um, but also to uh, Kelvin from uh, Lysian Bar down in Melbourne uh, and Peter Hollywood Bignall, the distiller and owner at Belgrove Distillery, who has been on a flyer at the last couple of days because <laughs> Jamie Oliver, we, we announced right, it actually. Gordon Ramsay. No, Gordon yeah, Ramsay. Yeah, aren't they the same? Celebrity <laughs> chef. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie. Yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea, right? Because we announced it on the one of these roundtables about two months ago. We, you know, oh, we that did. Coming up. So that has actually been released in the UK now. The trailer's out, but um, but yeah, a Hollywood Bignall is a bit of a movie star living up to his name uh, at the moment. So big big shout out to them. Um, but um, I'm a little bit in the same boat as and, and greetings from Tokyo, says Stefan. So that's excellent to, to say good day. And yes, I'm I'm waiting for you to come back or me to get to Tokyo so we can crack that bottle together, which is very very special to me um, of of Aaron. Um, but I'm a little bit in the same boat as Andy. I thought I had an Aaron kicking around. Um, from because we have a lot of bottles in weird places at the Oak Brow, and someone's put them all on one shelf. So we've got this couple of shelves just of half full bottles. And it was a North Star that I was really enjoying. And so I went to, went to grab it an hour ago. I realized that, yes, we've drunk it all. So it's the same color as the North Star one, but it's a 31 year old Invergordon. Um, <laughs> that we just go, go through. So, yeah. Well, I thought it was not nice not to have something to drink. I know it's only 10 to 5, 3 to midday. I don't know when it's actually nice to start drinking something but i was selling actually before uh, andy and matt i found an open bottle of the lag new make so i am i oh, am just cool. I'm, not, I'm not down in it okay i'm not like drinking it <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like the smallest little sip okay so it's it's all safe you know i'm a responsible adult to drink responsibly i'm just having a little sip just to join you guys you know uh because if you don't drink you know when other people are drinking it means that you're a traitor i'm not a traitor okay so that's why i'm <laughs> Can, uh, can you please describe that in intense uh, detail in a little while? Because I've never tried it and I would like to know. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Sure. Uh, Mary, do you want me to do yeah, it now? I, I found this. I'll just finish it. Sorry, I'll just, I found that. I, I, I didn't even realize. I forgot I had it. It's a 2008 uh, wow. Peter There you go. Oh, so, yeah, cool. It's yeah, it's a private, it's a private cask, it says. Bourbon barrel, Peter. 2008. There you go. I don't know. I forgot I had it. Looks nice. Yeah, we released so many bottles in the past and still like to this day we release so many bottles for different markets. So it's easy to to get lost, I would say. I've only joined a year and a half ago and I still don't know a third, maybe a fifth, a sixth of all the bottles that we released in the previous years. So mm. quite a lot. Yeah. By the way, I wanted to say the fact when you were talking about um, the distilleries, you know, that turned the corner. Actually, a lot of people tell me that Aaron changed massively as well from uh, 2000 and like... 10 onwards, since we changed our master distiller and like wood policy, a lot of people have told me that Aaron changed a I'm, little bit for the better. I'd agree too. with that. I, I, don't, I don't think there was any like negative. I wouldn't have put Aaron in the sort of same category of like, oh, you've, you know, you've, you've gone bad. But, you know, you've, you've really got to <laughs> fix things up and, and change it. But I think it was always, it was always this very light, delicate, it sat on the fence. And I don't Fair think it, it didn't punch a personality. It was more just, it was inoffensive, nothing wrong with the liquid, but I don't ever yeah, recall, you know, I don't recall it having that sort of punchy personality where you go, God, yeah, I want to talk about this. And then cool. there was, there was that twist. Uh, yeah. There was definitely a moment where I remember sort of going, ah, oh, this is really good. And I think, I think it was working here. with, working with Sakinda helped because I think he was starting to buy a single cast and model single casts. And you could tell that, you know, he suddenly started paying attention um, to something that he wasn't. You're like, yeah, something's changed here. <laughs> yeah. 
Over here, also, both the Loch Lomond whiskies from like Loch Lomond distillery and Glade Scotia apparently are getting more and more attention as well. They're releasing some very good things, which I'm not saying that they were like, you know, bad before, but maybe they were a little bit off the radar. But now I think I see them popping up more and more as well. I don't know if it's the same in Australia. Yeah, well, I, being completely independent, I can say uh, pretty without, without fear of repercussion that some Glen Scotia from 10 years ago was bloody awful. Um, there was some real dire juice in there. No, that's um, true. It was. The, pa the packaging <laughs> should have warned you off, but it didn't. Um, <laughs> was, it, was it those colourful cows on the label? Tagged on to, you know, before my, like, time in at the Oak Bar, I tagged on to whiskey <laughs> exchange orders for stuff I wanted. I need to get, like, four to, like, hit the shipping quota. It's like, that's cheap, and, you know, a bit funny. It's like, ooh, no. Um, <laughs> but just, just, just on Aaron, I found, like, there's been a change, but I actually don't think it's been a quality change. I think it's been a consistency change. Because uh, I know, I, and you know, Matt, you in the same, but we're very lucky to have a, a very good friend of ours who was a, an Aaron fiend who tried to collect every Aaron. Yeah, pretty much set himself broke doing so. But like every, like we're not just talking like the, the Devil's series and the book series, but like every release for every market. So with like hundreds of Aaron's and so, all the private casts and all the different things he every, that's like, like one, of, of, of all the of all the brands to pick. He's like we're the ones that bottle independently for every market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but like it was because there was some like exceptional exceptional juice whether that was just like the luck of the cask or whatever in the past sort of five years particularly with you know the rebrand in the past 12 months you you, you there's, there's a bit more consistency because every now and again there was a, a not so good cask i vaguely remember something that was an isla finished cask or something from aaron that was an american market exclusive that was was pretty okay. um pretty awful and never to be seen again um uh, a quick question, actually, on, on old school. Um, uh, actually, no, it's probably not old school, but the, a, a new school, Aaron, coming from Phil Brooks on the Facebook chat. Um, ha, Mary, have you seen or had tasted the Whiskey Club's 2008 Moscatel, Aaron? Uh, so the Whiskey Club is a big, uh, you know, subscription whiskey service in Australia um, that sort of started very, very small is now quite popular. Were you across that release at all? Unfortunately, not the specific one, I'm afraid, but I have, a, I have a feeling that I've tried similar ones because we actually borrowed a few Moscatels as distillery exclusives for our, um, uh, we, do, we do like tour guides, you know, like uh, we use like, you know, our tour guides on the labels as well and we give them like, you know, nice mm. names, we name them after the tour, tour guides too. And there were a few Moscatel casks. I was actually talking about it uh, with the Ryan, my um, the warehouse manager, Bullflag and Locranza Distillery, last Sunday on our Sunday club. And he told me that those are actually his favorite casks. I think is I think I had the feeling that those like was the same batch of casks that was given to you know whiskey club as well in this case. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't try the specific one, but I can say that it's actually lovely. It turns like the whiskey very pink, which is quite nice. It's kind of like ruby pink, uh, purpley, which is lovely. But taste-wise, there is something with iron and wine. I don't know. I, I think we discovered that very early that it just works because the liquid is not too overpowering or red. It's quite elegant. It's quite fruity and fresh. Um, but like, you know, quite a nice, you know, texture anyway. So but when you finish it in wine or mature it in wine, you know, not too much, but you actually do it very balancedly. Uh, it's lovely. So I do like Moscatel um, Aaron, but I don't have tried that specific one, I'm afraid. Yeah. Phil, Phil comments it was actually bottled the 16th of the 1st, 2018. Uh, not that that's going to help you, but I've got a feeling that Phil might be drinking that bottle right now and have it in his hands. I think that might be, well, that might be what's going <laughs> well, on there. I hope he enjoys it. I'm pretty sure it's great, though. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry if I didn't try that specific one. As I said before, we bottle a, maybe a billion bottles per month. So unfortunately, I don't try all of that. Mm. And here I thought Aaron was this small little island with this small little distilleries, but a billion <laughs> bottles a month. <laughs> the Argeo you eat your heart out. <laughs> Johnny Walker, look out. <laughs> yeah. uh, we increased capacity over the last three months now. We do like <laughs> He's, he's locked down really well. So just, <laughs> the island is a totally different place now. <laughs> uh, Mary, whilst no. you're tasting that new make uh, from Lag, can you tell us a bit of, about it? And absolutely. also, can you tell us a bit more about Lag in general? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, well, we opened the new distillery last year um, in May. Oh, yeah. So, actually, I think 
in a couple of days, on the 12th of this month of June, it'll be a birthday, it'll be like, you know, when we actually officially opened to the world and we opened our doors, you know, in the visitor yeah, center yeah. too. Um, so it's only a year, uh, which is, yeah, say only, but it's literally just uh, flying. Uh, but yeah, so we opened a new distillery on the southern part of the island. Um, so it couldn't be more far away from the first one. So you have to drive around the whole place to go visit them both, which is nice because island is a, Iron is a beautiful island. And we focused on peat. So we stopped the peated production at Locranza Distillery in the north. So now we're doing um, peated uh, malt, peated new make, peated spirit only down a lag. The distillery itself is very different. Obviously, it's much bigger in, you know, not only the site, but also the equipment. Everything is a little bit, you know, larger. So the mash tun is much bigger. We have um, we have 20,000 liters wash bags, uh, wooden wash bags. We have stills that are much, much bigger as well. And obviously, we're not trying to create uh, the same style of whiskey too. So this time around, we are using peated malt, which is uh, peated um, uh, for in Aberdeenshire. So we use mainland peat. Mm. Um, and the uh, fermentation time is roughly, it's not say roughly the same, but minimum is like around 70, 72 hours. Yep. Uh, but distillation is a little bit faster compared to Locranza. So at Locranza, we run one of the slowest distillations because our stills are quite, you know, small, onion shaped, you know, there's nothing special about them. They're quite tiny. Uh, not that tall. And so we run them extremely slow to, you know, get uh, a spirit that is very versatile, very elegant, you know, very estery and, and nice and fruity. While I like, we run them a little bit faster. Um, the line arms go all the way down as well. So we want to create a bit of a, you know, heavier, a heavier spirit. And we decided to bottle our new make at 63.5 percent. It's uh, it was only available at the distillery, but now since lockdown happened, you can actually buy some on our web shop uh, online too on our website. And um, I just love it because uh, it's uh, to me uh, it's just like a mezcal, but with the you know mixed with like you know whiskiness, like maltiness. So yes. it's very. Um, it still has the sweetness that our whiskey in general, our spirit in general tends to have. Uh, so that's why I, I say, you know, the smokiness is very subtle. It's not medicinal. It's not Isla. You can tell straight away. It's very much like a heathery, uh, earthy, you know, sort of smokiness. Um, and then the sweetness, the sweetness comes in. So you still get the fruitiness. I call it like an agave sweetness, but it's more like, you know, a, a fresh fruit, you know, sweetness too. Um, and then it's quite spicy and hot. Uh, so it, to me, it's just like a beautiful, delicious 63.5% uh, mezcal in my, in my mind. But obviously it does have, you know, influences of, you know, malt spirit, of course. But uh, I was actually doing some experiments at home to try and use this in cocktails instead, you know, as a mezcal, as if it was a mezcal or a tequila, just to see how it worked. Uh, I want to do a Paloma with a grapefruit, su uh, grape grapefruit soda and to see how it works because I think it'll be great. Yeah, very cool. Just, I mean, uh, sorry, just while the map is map is up, I will just keep it there, Scotty. I never to get back in. Never forget uh, a friend of ours from Campbelltown. Uh, if you want to zoom out a little bit more, um, and he said, you know, I said, do you know how it feels like growing up in Campbelltown? You know, he said, you know, everyone thinks, you know, with with the sort of the bane of Scotland. He said, oh, why? He said, you know, because. Because we're always called the floppy cock of Scotland. Like, <laughs> okay. I knew that was going. I knew that was going. And, and he said, but it's okay. He said, because we're not Aaron. They're the bulls. Exactly. <laughs> so, Do you know what? Yeah. I always say the same thing you're, when you're we never look at a map of Scotland again the same way. It, it, it's it was hilarious when we had to do the these guys. I've just found <clears> one. <throat> and we had to try and explain uh, our, you know, designing, you know, team not to make specific parts of Scotland look like, and we didn't know how to tell them. We're like, can you just, you know... Just so d does that mean if, if, if I try and get my way around Aaron, you know, buy the map on the back of the tin, I'm going to be wrong because it's not actually geographically 100% <laughs> correct? Yeah, that sounds that's not that right. That sounds correct. It's in the curvature. <laughs> yeah. No, it is correct. It is correct. You'll, you'll still be able to... Mm. Nothing major change, just maybe slightly the sizes and uh, and the shapes. And like, yeah. This is um, still fine. Uh, Mary, just in terms of lag and Aaron, as you said, mm. different spirits, does this mean that uh, I know that Aaron has experimented and released different peated whiskies as well before? Does this yeah. mean we can probably expect lag to be the output for peat and like Aaron won't do any peating at all? 
I think that's what's going to happen in the future, but I can't confirm 100%. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's more actually, I more think about it on a, a business point of view. I think it would be, it wouldn't be beneficial to have two pitted expressions coming from two different distilleries, just confusing, you know, customers even more. That said, though, as I always say, Mike Remore, there is, uh, there is our pitted uh, Locranza distillery whiskey. It's still... Uh, mm. being bottled is still available and we still have lots of stock um, in the warehouses so we have a lot of peated stock at the moment of Locranza so yeah. um, this, there's not going to be a change anytime soon but maybe when you know lag comes of age in a couple of years things could change but uh, unfortunately it's, um, it's a secret still so no one knows what's going to happen yeah no, fair enough fair enough it's just, just a question. I don't know if you just asked this question, but it's a question coming in from the one of the, the Oak Barrel Facebook from, from Stefan, uh, who, if you haven't read Whiskey Rising, uh, go out and buy it wherever you can buy it um, and read it. I uh, was wondering if, with the loosening of the SWA regulations in terms of the cast types that are allowed uh, for maturation, uh, that whether Aaron has started filling into any new cast types that you haven't experimented with before, knowing full well that Aaron has played with a lot of different cast types. Um, so, like, Aaron Tequila Cask, in about five, oh, six those, years' time. Okay. Yeah. So, no. like, but like, but <laughs> has that think... anything in uh, that really, like, you're not just a killer, like, is there anything new that you might be playing with? Uh, I don't know what I can say, really. Like, <laughs> that's I don't right. Know it's, it's, just, it's just us and about a million other people. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm allowed to say, you know, before I lose my job. I don't, I, as far as I know, there's nothing, ultra, there's nothing uh, extreme as a tequila cask. Uh, we do have um, a lot of wine, uh, which is uh, a lot of different types of wine, uh, which possibly will be, bought, you know, will be bottled soon. Uh, when you know everything goes back to normal, we could do you know some uh, limited edition you know stuff like that uh, with our wine casks. But in terms of like extreme, I don't think we are. I, d I don't think there is anything th to that level. Bear in mind that until like you know a year ago, we were still experimenting with peat so that we would be ready to open lag. So we did a lot of experiment experimentations with uh, peat. We had whiskey that was peated at 15, at 20, and then 50 ppm. So we've done a lot of that to just see how it changed. But right now, I think we're mostly focusing on uh, uh, just the core range because the rebrand, you know, is taking a lot of stock and, um, you know, a lot of the whiskey that we are maturing in the warehouses. There's a lot of sherry involved lately, which we always done anyway, but now you see more things coming out in terms of uh, Amontillado, Palo Cortado, as I said before, which is quite exciting, mm. but nothing out of the ordinary. What about, and I'm just going to throw this out there, and the oak barrel, if it doesn't work, we might, you know, buy half a cask at the end of, the, you know, after six years, but lag matured in mezcal casks. Oh, oh. that would be cool, wouldn't it? That would be very cool. I'll buy that. But uh, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> I would totally buy that. Especially <laughs> very young, like three-year-old lag matured in mezcal. Like, yeah. totally like mezcal, like, totally. aged mezcal matured in ex bourbon casks that's then sold to Aaron to mature lag. Or what yeah, about I, what about ex ex Aaron casks then matured at lag? Yeah, we were talking about this on Sunday too. What about doing a blended oh, malt and do like you know a young Aaron and a young lag put together, like you know bourbon cask and young lag, yeah. and just see how you know what happens. That would be a good idea too. But uh, it's all down to our lovely uh, production uh, director James McTaggart. So it's him making the decision. But that said, I don't know. It could be. We actually uh, have a lag in orchard, so we're thinking uh, we're going to do exper experiments with apples. So what I think will happen most likely is something related to cider or to brandy, because if we have apples, we have a little specific like, you know, room that is just uh, there to play around with the apples that we're going to have on site. So maybe we'll do something, you know, with lag apples, uh, lag cider or lag brandy, but then again, we need to wait a few years because the apples are not there yet. So Pomo, big fan of Pomo. Love a Pomo. <laughs> Peated Calvados? Could that be um, a thing? Peated just Pomo. We keep talking. The talk of uh, uh, Campbelltown has got me moving on to Kilkerran Open Day 2016. Nice. That should be that should be finished tonight, I reckon. Yeah, there you go. Um, is there? I mean, 
for people who have, like enjoy Macro more and the Aaron Peter releases in the past, how different do you think large single malt peated is, is going to be? Like not as new make, but as it's when it's matured and when it's released in four, five, six years time. Like, is there going to be a noticeable difference? Do you think? I f- I think so. Yeah, I don't think. I think we're definitely trying to have two completely different styles for two completely different, you know, distilleries, and we try to separate them as much as possible to so the consumers are, you know, pretty. Um, for for them, it's just very clear, you know, what we're doing company wise and distilleries wise. Um, in me personally, I was expecting, uh, I think I was expecting much more like, uh, like I was expecting a punch of smokiness. Like I was expecting like an, an Isla, you know, smokiness, but actually I think because it's just, you know, m- m- fermented so well and distilled so well and everything, it's still very subtle. So uh, it's not gonna be like the heaviest, you know, whiskey that you get out there. It's still gonna be a very nice, balanced, smoky whiskey at the end of the day, which is ultimately what the company, you know, wants to do anyway, just produce good quality whiskey that is well balanced, which is fair enough. Uh, but I, I, when I tried the new make, I, I can see how this is gonna, you know, come down at some point and set stage in the casks and just be a very beautiful, you know, complex drum in the future. I don't think it's gonna be one of those, woo, you know what I mean? It's gonna be a, oh, this is nice. Like he has everything I want. He has balance, he has texture, he has smokiness, he has fruitiness, he has, you know, like sweetness and all together, you know, working very well. That's what I hope and what I think is gonna be. I still reckon- Go home and it done. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say Kill Homan as, as an example. and um, But th- on the other side of the coin, uh, this is a bit of a, uh, might be a bit controversial, but I think it is. A bit of a, I honestly think that the best, the best peated whiskey at the moment in Scotland is not coming from Isla. Dun, dun. Yeah. Do we need to guess? You've been drinking Anok Peter, surely. Uh, I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I meant to refer to the new Spayburn three-year-old Peter edition, but um, I mean, what I was what I was re- really referring to is no, I think there's a lot of good mainland and island Peter whiskies coming out, uh, which are um, uh, performing like really well. I won't say better than Isla, but they're 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 they're, they're quite different, and mm. I think that they're um they're they're quite exciting, and it's because there's there's flavors and profiles and uh, tasting notes within those whiskies that you just. Like you're just not used to in some ways because it's it's so foreign. It's not the it's not the classic peat. And all of a sudden, that's right. It's not that classic boggy have, sort of um Isla peat. It's not that sort you of. You can have this heather, the moss, the delica, and it's yeah, yeah. The, the, and, the whiskey's sitting there at the bottom. And I think everyone's learned that ex bourbon, you know, certain for mainland peat, ex bourbon is the way forward, and you yeah. want young spirit and let it shine. And this yeah. idea of you know thirty year old mainland peat is like yeah, that's okay. You know, I think um, Ben Rick is probably the only one that's doing. Sherry's, I was going to mention very like, <laughs> sherry rich peated whiskey is probably the only style. Yeah, and that um, I've I've sort of seen successfully done. But then you've got Balekin from Edradow. You've got yeah, yeah, you know, all yeah. the peated stuff from Anok. Um, the, Glen Turret's new ones have been excellent. Legend, well, I really like Glen, Glen Turret uh, as yeah, Glen Turret as Rud Moore uh, as they call it. They're um they're peated runs at Glen Turret, uh, which is which is uh, I've just tasted a bunch of we call it Code Sixteen. Uh, a bunch of 16 casks which are coming through, which are unbelievable. Uh, mm. and tr- like truly and, phenomenal Peter whiskeys. And it's like the Chegg would be the other one. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Well, the Chegg, yeah. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe maybe Lag will end up being closer to the Chegg in profile than Lafroig in profile, for instance. Yeah, which is yeah. very exciting. Yeah. I, I, I agree, I Matt. Really Bailey. Like I was dead. <laughs> I, I did not say that. You, I did not say you I heard it here first. Matt Bailey from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society said, Isla's dead. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> moving on. Give, it moving on. Give it a few years. And then, like, during the same week of Isla Festival, someone will organize a peat festival on the mainland, and all of the distilleries <laughs> will join in and they will all bring their peated stock, and we're all oh, yeah. peated, not from Isla. And then the world will oh, split into. Oh, you wait. There'll be someone there with a the sword from Ard Beg stabbing people. Don't worry. It'll be. There'll yeah. be a, uh, it's. It's not as if there's anywhere else in mainland Scotland that's got just as few hotels as either. Anyway, it's just like wherever else you plan on doing it, it's, just like, it's still <laughs> the middle of nowhere. It's like, well, we can we can house ten people. Like it's... Your, your tent will still be of use. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Caravans are still required. Um, a, a question that ties into something that we did, or that's happened in New South Wales here in Australia recently, with <clears throat> Joadja releasing their first paddock to bottle um, barley grown on site whiskey. Uh, Stefan comes in with another corker question. Um, 
when and we're going back a little bit now. He he interned at Lock Ranza, interned at Lock Ranza Distillery for a couple of weeks back in 2015. James was getting ready to use local Aaron uh, barley um, in some in some runs. Uh, firstly, like how was that? How is that developing? Like, is it is it tasting very differently to the barley sauce from from the mainland uh, maltings? Um, and have you continued to use that barley uh, every year? You're still doing that. Is that still an ongoing program? So as far as I know, because I remember asking this to James personally, because this question was asked to me before, uh, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, though, I could always be wrong, obviously, but <laughs> as far as I know, we don't have any more Aaron Barley, Aaron whiskey um, maturing in our warehouses, because all that we tried previously has been already bottled in the, few, in the, in the past. Uh, and obviously, you know, people absolutely love the idea, you know, it's, we always uh, put ourselves on the same level as Oklahoma, you know, like a small independent, you know, company from an island, you know, you know, 46% good quality whiskey, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I think it's, it would be nice, you know, it's nice to have an 100% iron whiskey uh, made, considering that we don't do our own full mortings and everything. So Rabai and Stefan, I think we don't have anything in, at the moment, um, in the warehouses, as far as I know. Unfortunately, I was never lucky enough to try the previous batches, so I don't know how they taste like, but uh, I never heard anyone saying something bad about them. But when we purchased lag, we not only we bought the lag, uh, you know, the site, the warehouses and the orchard, we also bought free barley fields. So I think I'm pretty sure that, you know, we want to do more 100% iron whiskies in the future, being either Lag or Locranza whiskey, we don't know yet, but there's definitely that, you know, uh, that idea, the goal in the future to do it again. Mm. Yeah, I think I think I find those whiskies really fascinating, um, and you, we've seen a lot from you know, Brook Laddick, Obviously, Springbank have done local barley's, and personally, I love them because if you go to the effort of, you know, sourcing local barley, whether you're growing it yourself or using local farmers, like all the you know expenses and costs associated with that process your end result you want people to actually taste barley you don't want it to be covered by the, otherwise what's the point so i always find them very honest and, and raw whiskies um and yeah. peter Ho peter it's hollywood spirit, they're all spirit led yeah spirit. peter hollywood big has just chimed in with a comment about the peat conversation we we're having before um that he feels like when we're talking about peat not from isla we should mention the bogan burnout uh which was a bit of a mover and shaker <laughs> at last year's whiskey fair uh, and Mariella, uh, if you don't know the word bogan, are you familiar with that? No. no. So basically, a bogan is is a term for someone in Australia who's a little bit like me, a little bit rough around the edges. Will probably do a burnout in, on your on your quiet neighbourhood street and then steal your car at the same time. This um, Australia's equivalent of a chav. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. So yeah, me. Um, but, Peter, but Peter did release a, a new make spirit that was bogan burnout. That was a little bit mezcalish. Um, you next in Australia, I've got a couple of samples left. We'll have to let you have a go at it. But that's that's something different altogether. <laughs> okay. So By the way, dead. I wanted to say <laughs> hi to... Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry, Mary. All good. No, I just wanted to say to, hi to Stefan because actually I just purchased this uh, book. Actually, this is very random. Last week because I've done a um, Santori whiskey lessons with the UK brand ambassador, James, which is wonderful. And he kept mentioning Stefan's book. So I was like, okay, it's time to buy that book. So I'm looking forward to it. So yeah. it's going to be nice. But for anyone who wants to know about Japanese whiskey, not just how it is in 2020, 2019, but also the history and how we got here and the forces that, that made that, um, Stefan's book, Whiskey Rising, is is excellent. Um, we, we have it here on, on and off, but completely honest, you can buy it cheaper from the UK and somewhere and they'll ship it to you next day, book depository, whatever it is. But um, it's out there. Um, Dave Broom also does an excellent one. Um, that's, you know, also very, very good for me. The one that I always reference before I need to go up on stage and talk about Japanese whiskey is Whiskey Rising. Uh, for me, that is the authority. I think that the, Dave's, Dave's, Dave's book is very much, it paints... So for someone who's never been, it paints this beautiful picture of the place and his experience and the interactions with it, which is his, his phenomenal at that style of writing. It brings you to a place without you ever being there. Um, and it's almost where you read Dave's book first. Actually, Stefan's is, is next on my list. So I'm just trying to get through uh, Raw Spirit at the moment, um, Ian Banks, which I've had for years and never read. Um, Same, actually. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those books that you're told, you know, you must get this, you must, uh, I never actually read it, so I'll pick that up. 
Um, but yeah, I feel like you sort of you set up for the seven with with Dave. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I'm excited um, to read it. A, a, a quick question from uh, Stefan Nalen on, on the Oak Barrel chat: Is do the Oak Barrel sell whiskey books? Yes, we we do a little bit, but. We are a, we're a booze retailer and we're in the centre of Sydney and so we have certain margins we need to meet because of that. Um, book like Fiscal book retailing has been very interesting in the past 10 years and you can buy some books very cheap online. So we dabbed our toes in it a little bit um, and then realised that when, you know, the site I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of like book aggregator sites like booko.com.au will type in, you type in any book anywhere in the world, and I've done it recently for books on bitters and Armagnacs and different other things, oh, and it'll give you, of course. yeah, of course, yeah, I'm, I'm a bitters guy, <laughs> uh, and then you see the list of everything, and we always ended up at the very bottom of that list, um, so, we, like, a lot of people would come in and see the books that we had and then Google it and go buy it somewhere else, which is just, that's just what we found, um, mm. so we, we've moved away from that, um, but but certainly it's something we're, we're looking at, but, uh, you know, you know, definitely... Google, uh, and I know uh, there's a person who regularly comes onto Matt's society streams called um, Murray, who is probably jumping up and down in his seat, the most knowledgeable person on uh, whiskey literature in, in Australia with, with a yeah. lot to say about this. So, By a long um, shot. Yeah, so there's actually probably a good links that maybe Matt can, yeah. can point you to, or, or at least Murray can, the best yeah. places to buy books in, in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, I, I love every time I go to a bookstore is just looking for anything whiskey related. I lucked out a couple of years ago finding not an original, but like an early printing of Michael Jackson's, um, you know, just uh, one of his books on whiskey. Uh, I think it was printed in the mid 80s. And it was fascinating to read about like Australia got a mention as like their whiskey producing country. No one knew we were producing whiskey back then. But also mm. uh, one of my favorite lines that I like to bring up in, in you know, particularly Japanese tastings, he talks about Suntory. Uh, you know, Hakshu and, and Yamazaki. And, and then as a, and one of the lines is there, um, as a general rule, sherry casks are not used in Suntory. Mm. And like when people complain about why the Yamazaki 18 is so expensive and not around anymore, it's like, well, back then they weren't using these casks. They didn't think about it. And the 18 is so sherry driven. If <clears> like, <throat> even those books that may not be current right now, like they're not going to mention Aaron Distillery, but they're a really great snapshot into you know, the 80s and the 90s, and even the early noughties. So just like go to a regional area, stick your head into a bottle shop, you never know what you might find liquid-wise. Old, old uh, bookstores, always stick your head in, see for the food and drink section. You never know what you might find that's out of print. I was. I remember picking up a wine book. I think it was an old Jancis Robinson book years years ago. And that was the same thing. It had a comment on Australia. And it sort of said, you know, there's, there's some wine production taking place in Australia, nothing of note. And that was <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's right. I love that one. I love that one. Uh, one of my favorites was just even recently finding an old book, uh, which I think was just called the, the World of Spirits. And it was written in the 70s or 80s. I can't remember what year when it was written, but it's an old hardcover book and it has a section on whiskey and a section on gin and a section on vodka, etc. cetera. And, uh, the World of Spirits. It's not even a very big book. So it doesn't <laughs> cover too much. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this is what the this is the context of what you could find. It wasn't like now you can write books on Japanese whiskey, and not just Japanese whiskey, mm. very very niche on Japanese whiskey. But this was like the world of spirits, and it was about two hundred pages. And it was um and uh, I, I looked at the whiskey section, and it referenced maybe half a dozen Scotch whiskey distilleries. And one of them that it referenced was Lagavulin, and it said uh, the only expression available on the market of Lagavulin is the twelve year old white horse. And it's like, oh man, this book is going back a bit. When the only like one that tested <laughs> was a twelve-year-old spring cap white horse bottling, and it's like, it's this well before the sixteen even existed or anything like that. It's so I, I love, I, but I love finding curios like that in, in whiskey literature because, as Scott was saying, the way that they write about it, the way that it, it gives you a snapshot of the time, mm. uh, which is just fascinating. But yeah, and people do the same with the books being written now. They'll read them and they'll be even more of a snapshot because they're even more niche. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's that's such a great, like, I think going back very, very, like, to when we started this stream, uh, Mary, you were talking about, like, that Klein Leash, and we started talking about, like, you know, these great vintages. What I love about a vintage whiskey, as opposed to an age statement, is with an age statement, you sort of need to understand what a, a Lagerville and 16 looks like 10 years ago, as opposed to, to now, whereas a vintage is always going to be, you know, it's always going to get harder to find and harder to find. Um, and I think that's that's part of the, like the love and the the romance about whiskey is capturing those those points in time and going, 
what else was happening in the world at that point? Who was farming what? Who was distilling what? What was the technologies around at that point in time? Uh, and it's moving so quickly now that we we can do this almost every 10 years, you know, change of production methods and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, books are a very visceral and, you know, tangible element of, of that, you know, unless, you know, Dave Brooms obviously, you know, updates his Atlas and I, I love the Atlas. Um, hmm. But I still reference the first edition to see what the difference is between the second. You know, the hmm. uh, talk about a distillery, I will get the last five, six years and go, what has been changed? It might just be a couple of sentences, hmm. but that means a lot. Um, and for a young distillery like Aaron, that's obviously going to be a little bit bigger than, like the change is going to be a little bit more dramatic than some other distilleries who've been here for 200 years. But I, I like that for me, I love doing that. Yeah. Well, even I, I, don't know, I don't have a, you know, any friends or a girlfriend or anything like that's how I spend my days but you know <laughs> reading all these yearbooks from the previous decade <laughs> <laughs> I think we all had the same thought though because even I during lockdown well my boyfriend works in you know in, in books so I, I'm surrounded by books constantly so before I wouldn't even think about you know I, I do read every now and then I do buy you know the occasional whiskey book or beer or you know anything book that I want but now that I'm bombarded by books when I was in lockdown I actually went on this uh, as you said like this website to find some you know old stuff and I found an Alfred Barnard I never bought an Alfred Barnard book you know uh, I never had one in my house and I found one and I was like that's a great buy, you know, it was the centenary edition. And I honestly, I just went, I just went through, I know this sounds like I can't read, but honestly, I was so fascinated by the images. I was like, oh my God, this was, you know, like, like a bullion distillery at the time. And if you see how things changed, you know, now, or the advertisements at the back of the book, I mm. love them. I was like, I was so fascinated. I was like, oh my God, things changed, you know, so much. And the I'm, most I'm fascinating thing was that I turned the cover around just to have a look. And someone wrote down Milroy's 1987. So God only knows what that means. I was, I was like, you know, I was having a magical moment there. I was like, that's very cool. I should buy more books. Used books, actually. It's very nice. And, and as Scotty said, it's when you walk into these old bookshops or you walk into like um, the old bottle shops, even like walk into something like Berry Brothers and Rudd, or you walk into even the vaults, mm. God, even as, a, as an SMWS example, it's like you're walking into, a, it's stepping back in time. It's, 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 you're getting the, the, yeah. the current and the and the past all, all wrapped up in that. I've also just got uh, Pipil's book too. Uh, oh, yeah. It only came out recently. I still have to read it though, but yeah, it, it made it, me think about SNWS. It's a, it's a crazy read. I'll tell you what, he uh, he doesn't um he, he doesn't let back, he doesn't hold back at all. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it's more like his weird one. I know what he's going to bring out now, is it? No, so because I... Um, slowly, because I technically live at the Oak Barrel now, I spend more time here than anywhere else. My book collection has slowly migrated in parts. Um, so I just went and grabbed like a couple of books that I've got out the back that we've been talking about to sort of like represent this to, to people. Uh, to, to Gabriella, is Oak Barrel After Hours happening tonight? No, it might happen tomorrow night to Gabriella. Um, Oak Barrel After Hours is just the when I talk rubbish with our um, wine person. Um, but that's the, that's the Whiskey Rising, Stefan's book that you should rush out and buy wherever you can find it um, at the moment. But this is the one that I mentioned Great book. Um, before the old Michael Jackson one that I picked up for like 15 bucks somewhere. Wow. It's an old 80s thing. And like what you would, you prompted <clears throat> me, Mary, then with like the old, um, like the old ads on the back. Um, Love those. Various things. Mm. Uh, you know, and you get to see all the old uh, like <clears throat> labels and, and that sort of stuff. And that's just capturing yeah. time, you know. One of the early editions of Wikipedia by Charlie McLean. Um, yeah. Again, just another great reference to see how they were talking about whiskey. Um, you know, the old Craig Gellerhe, um labeling, which you know, as someone who wasn't drinking Craig Gellerhe twenty years ago, I didn't know what that looked like. Mm -hmm. um, I'll see the yearbook. But something else that I I find quite fascinating is I've got a, a friend who, who did work in publishing, an old housemate of mine, and. Um, so she uh, just sent me this book, 30 Second Whiskey, that was um, uh, edited by Charlie, but forward was um, Ian Buxton, who's written a lot of books. Yeah. And it's it's the hints in the name, 30 Second Whiskey. It's, you know, I'm, I want to get into whiskey. It's a like Christmas stocking stuffer, that sort of thing, real basics. But it was actually really interesting for me to sort of like wind back a little bit and try and understand what mm. from experts who do this all day, every day, all around the world, what people actually want to talk about, you know, you know, I, I might wash over the term washback and they go, okay, no one else in the room knows what a washback is. So 
Um, yeah. And, you know, so I find this is was quite valuable, but in, you know, 10 years' time, this would be really valuable to go back and, like, this is how we were talking about whiskey back then. Mm. Um, so that, that's just a bit of a bit of a snapshot of, of what I have. I've got a, a bunch more and, and that sort of thing. But, um, yeah. Yeah. By the way, going back to vintages, I'm sorry, I also wanted to say this. When you said someone, you know, you get attached to vintages, you start thinking, oh, who might have distilled when, what, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, for a while, I, thought I, I was obsessed with Beaumont from uh, 93, 94, 95, especially 95. I was like super obsessed with Beaumont from 95. And Sukinder bottled such wonderful things during like when I was working at the time as well. So yeah. I was very spoiled. SNWS, I remember buying so many. There were like a, a facial bottles as well from 95. And only when I joined the Iron, I got to know... James, and otherwise I would have never known that he distilled those when he was still working at Beaumont. So I remember when we were talking, I was like, oh yeah, I really like Beaumont. He said, oh, that's where I used to work and I lived there you know, with my wife and my dogs. And I'm like, you were the guy that distilled the Beaumont 95. So all of the whiskeys that I have, you know, that I've been collecting all these years, I got yeah. to meet, you know, the maker only years after thanks to this job. So that was very cool. We bottled quite a few casks actually at the site of, of between 95 and 97 actually. Of uh, of for more Very from that delicious year. stuff. And most of them uh, were either first fill or second fill sherry butts um, from that era. And the, that's the, another you know complex balance. You know you got tropical fruits, you got sweetness, smokiness, saltiness, all just beautifully together. It's absolutely stunning stuff. Oh yeah, it's great. It's and it was uh, one of my favorite. I've, I've talked. I've said this story a hundred times, but it's still one of my favorite member complaints was that uh, too many of those old bemores. You know, can we get some, can we get some more variation in some of the peated stock? And it was like, yeah, we're trying. It was this is this was five years ago, mind you. But sort of like you know, there's, there's so many threes coming through that it was like, ah, what do we do with all these? All these lovely single cast bemores, too many of them. Oh well. It's it's funny to describe bemore as an underrated distillery, but I think for, for like for people who have got into whiskey in the past five years and their you know introduction was through through the core range. Um, particularly before the 15 darkest, which I think has been a bit of a game changer domestically in Australia to sort of show the breadth of the spirit in, in a really good light. And go, okay, it's good, but it's nothing special. And you had to you had to go back and like spend five grand on a 60s bottling to understand why it was special. Um, but but I, they, I think it's, it's really underrated. I think they, they had they had the essence of this, like, let's try and build a campaign. Because <clears throat> obviously you had the... Uh, there was there was a certain distiller that I think didn't didn't, didn't do so well with it, um, and and before that it was it was wonderful, and then there was a, a, a middle part. Bit, bit, hey. Bit. Uh, hey everyone! Hey. I'm sorry, um, my colleague just looked. At- <laughs> she didn't know I was doing this. Well, this is a friendly chat. Come and say hi. Yeah, come say good day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if people will understand you, but come and say hi anyway. She's got the thickest Scottish accent I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> this is Nicole. Oh, hi. Hello. Hey, from Sydney. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Just come in to get documents off you. Go for it. No sorry. worries. Just, it's fine. Don't swear. Um, Never. But yeah, no, you, you then have those, those great moments of like Beaumont Deluxe, Black Beaumont, Gold Beaumont, White Beaumont. Oh, yeah. Um, and these these superb pillars of that brand's history, but then I, they kind of originally had that with sort of was it Devil's Devil's Cut what they called it or Devil's Cask? Oh yeah, things like that. Yeah. Devil's Cask, it was yeah. Uh, and, it, and I think Devil's Cut of, is Jim Beam. That's right. Yeah, it's Devil's <laughs> Cask. Um, slightly slightly different. different. Slightly different. Yeah. But you could see them building on this idea of like let's build a hype, let's build development, and they did three, and the first one was really good. Second one, third one, it just sort of didn't quite follow the same trajectory of greatness. Mm. And they just sort of went, ah, let's just make good whiskey. And it, it was weird. They just stopped and just went, let's just not bother about this like releases and special and fancy and just went, should we just make whiskey? And uh, it's probably the best thing they've ever done. And they, you know, they may not have do the you remember the, Do you remember the Tempests? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They were very good. I really like And this was really that good. Was and good even, even the first vaults, the first vaults that they did was way overpriced. Mm. I like these chats. More... I get to geek out a little bit. Uh, this is the first time I do one of these. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, 
it's different not, to chat for <laughs> yeah not constantly on brands chat i really like it she does it more often yeah, it's it's funny actually uh some of the parts of Bamore history that i i find most fascinating is the connection with australia is the connection with the the gillies club and the the history of the selection of black Bamore and um stuff like that which i find uh fascinating and that there's uh, that's i mean there's, there's an element of australian history of single malt appreciation in australia that i find deeply fascinating but it, it's it's truly nerdy stuff i know but it's like do you, do you want to just like go over that very quickly matt because there's a lot of people that won't have heard but you know australia in particular with the more we have a long history with you want to like give a quick wrap up of that yeah i mean just, it's, i'm gonna I'm, just, I'm watching. Just, be- just before you do just as a small anecdote when mario and i both were starting in whiskey exchange we had a customer that's regular bottle was black Bamore, and they would come and pick it up once a month and i think it, i think it was 300 pounds and that was their you know their daily drop daily drop and you're just like Fuck. yeah that well there, there was a the, the, the only history that i know and I, i'm gonna get this wrong and I'm, i don't even know if i'm supposed to talk about it but it's like there's 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 a thing in australia called the gillies club which was one of the first whiskey clubs in australia which was uh um and it's uh and one of the first single malt whiskey clubs in the world. Yes. Because other whiskey clubs, you know, dealt with blends, but Gillies was strictly single malt back in what the seventies, eighties, when it was I do have the history sheet somewhere on my computer and I've got to reread it. I understand that. Um But there was there was a bottling which was a silver sort of squat bottle, almost like the Aaron shape. And it was sort of like this squat uh bottle with a silver label that said um like Bamore age 21 years, I think, or 20 years. I don't want to get the story wrong. I'm going to get it wrong. But it was about 20-something-year-old whiskey. It was a first fill sherry cask for more from the 1960s. And uh, when it was, uh, or maybe even earlier, but it was, and then it was, um, and it was selected by the Gillies Club for its members. And that became essentially the first iteration of what would then become uh, Black Bamore, first edition years after. And I, I, and then people tell me those stories like 300 pounds is even is twice what it was sold for when it first came out. The first black ball was something like 140 pounds or something when it first released. And it was an absurd amount of money for whiskey back then. Uh, and is now one of the most desirable and, um, you know, talked about bottlings. And I've had the great pleasure of tasting both that original silver uh, labeled edition of it. And I've had, I've tasted black on, on a number of occasions, which I've been lucky to do, but it's, it's just like, there's, there's something about that uh, era about how, what, an Australian whiskey club is bottling influences what ends up becoming one of arguably one of the most desirable single malt bottlings in history, yeah. um, which is, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, what well, we can count on one hand, really like those kind of names. Like if we say McCallan, Grand Reserva, Black Bamore, Rora, kind of like there's those names in those mythical sort of pieces of history. And some of them, some of those, some of that history is deeply rooted in Australia. Some of it's deeply rooted with the SNWS. But some of it comes through in different iterations, and I just I love I love those tidbits in history, which paint a story of how how we um how it's how it all comes together. Yeah, and I think you know that it's what I love about the Gillies Club um, and that history is yes, those you know what the cast they chose became mythical all around the world. Um, but it was about people getting together. And there's a quick um, uh, comment on the Facebook chat here from Mark Gordon. It says, Margaret River has had a single malt club, uh, single malt, like, so single malt for well over a decade. Uh, many from the wine industry love their malts there. And uh, the comment Rosebank comes out. So, um, yeah, Mark, if you want to sell me any of your uh, hidden under the counter Rosebanks, you know, you forgot them under the couch. Yeah, more than, more than welcome. Well, we're all here. We're all here already. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll, we'll happily, if, if you want to donate any whiskey to us, we'll happily review it on here for free. You know, that's, that's no worries. I'm you're, actually you're, a professional get- Brora reviewer. So I, I review Brora professionally. So if you need to send any Brora to me for a professional analysis, yeah. Um, and, and one comment, just rowing back a, a couple of sentences, uh, someone that Mary will know quite well, a uh, very good looking gentleman called Liam Clarkin, um, who might have been your tour guide last time in uh, never Australia. Never met him. Yeah, never, yeah, that's what I thought. I've never met him either. Um, when we're talking about the devils, not as good as the devil's punch bowl is uh, Liam's comment there. Which yeah, <laughs> the devil's punch bowls were very nice, actually. Well, uh, the devil's punch bowl is... Um, 
I don't even know how to explain it properly. Uh, I'm, I'm lacking the words. Uh, it's like a, um, between two mountains, there's like, a, you know, this uh, valley sort of thing, like this space. So it looks like, you know, a pan it's like a bowl. So it looks like a punch bowl. So when you go hiking, you can go hike and around this, you know, this space. And uh, we, did an, we did limited edition uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, three different editions of uh, very, very nice, you know, fruity, fruity, old, uh, uh, I say old, but I, I think it was like maybe around 14, 15 year old uh, iron whiskey. If you tried the 14 year old, uh, the, yeah, the, the 14 year old whiskey that we don't do anymore, you get what I mean. It was just like very, very fruity, fruity stuff, which is just, you know, very delicious. Unfortunately, those ones are going out on auction for quite a, you know, quite a lot of money too. Uh, there's some comments and questions on the SMWS stream. Victoria McDonald says, I can see you, Mariella. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know Victoria. I don't know. She sounds, sounds like she knows you, but she can see you. That's what she says. Denver Kramer also says, uh, I just got back on such an excellent book by Michael Jackson. Uh, still reference that. What's everyone's favorite online slash non-app uh, source? Uh, I'll start off just by saying uh, I still use scotchwhiskey.com. Uh, even though the site isn't getting regular updates, it's such a valuable resource. And uh, while I love the Malt Whiskey yearbook, I actually buy the yearbook for uh, the, actually, I normally buy the yearbook for the articles at the, at the front and the back and the, the, the industry stats. The distillery info is good, but it's a bit sort of like, oh, this year they released an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old, which is interesting, but it doesn't really tell me anything. No, it's, I, it's, it's I find that useful for uh, how it's grown in production. So you look at production yeah. this year versus so last year. Versus exactly, this, yeah. year. this one with that one. Yeah, I've got a 2014, 15, 16, all those years of yearbook, they're great. But I still use, uh, for online resource, I still use <coughs> whiskey.com. I still use, actually, I sometimes use whiskey.com, which is, uh, um, what's his face? Um, uh, name is, what's that? Becky? No, 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 no. Um, no, Becky Scott. Hans, Hans. Oh, sorry. No, Becky, yeah. No, just whiskey.com is, is, um, was quite good oh. and it's still quite good. Oh, it's very, it's yeah. very Becky. It's old. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's out of date. It's had, no, it's a lot of it's out of date. I get that, but it's still it's still quite a no. But, it, but it's also like it's old as in like I, for the life of me, I can't remember his name, but he's he's been around for yeah yeah yeah. He, and he, and he does uh, he does a lot of he a lot of YouTube reviews and everything like that. Yeah, but um no. Anyway, my answer would be scotchwhiskey.com. Any uh, for you guys? Uh, personally, scotchwhiskey.com. When it was active, <laughs> even though it's not active now, and again, it could be a really good time capsule if if it doesn't get updated. Um, but on that time capsule sort of method, uh, Malt Madness to go back and oh, just like yeah. see, just yeah. see that really old school breakdown. Uh, a lot of people yelling Horst on the uh, OB. Horst, Horst, yes, Horst Lunig, sorry. Horst Lunig, yeah. yes, lovely guy. Yeah. Sorry, he's um, math yeah. at Han, sorry. I thought it was yeah. I started with H. So, yeah, so, so that's, um, that, that, that's my, my two. Obviously, um, Full disclosure: I'm involved with an Australian one that is is not launched and is a little bit quiet. <laughs> so, um, but that's like what I what I am trying to do as as a former journalist is I look at Scotch whiskey and be like, if I can be half as good as that, then that is like that's still my ultimate goal. Mm. Uh, I think the, the the big difference is the style of journalism. So Becky, who was the the editor for ScotchWhiskey.com, mm. she's she's a journalist by trade, and so her approach to writing and Scotty, you'll appreciate this, you know, her, her approach to writing um, came from a very much, you know, a journalistic approach and it came from a, you know, you find, you investigate, you understand, you write. And, you know, I think I'm not being, you know, I don't mean this as a, as a harsh statement, but a lot of blogs are opinion driven and, and that's it it's, it's here's my opinion here's my thoughts here's my musings and and the longer and longer you do you know a friend of mine who's been writing a blog for 20 years you know he said if you want to write a blog have a secret blog and write and write and write and write and you'll be good enough you know because you understand when your voice appears uh, and i think yeah. that's that's why I loved the articles on Scot Scotch whiskey because they were factual, they were impartial, they would provide information, there was no bias. Yep. And, and it's hard to, to cut through all the blogs to know who's influenced, who's opinionated. Yeah. Or, and is, is this because you love this? Is this because someone's paid for you to do this? Is this, this? And there's, there's no issues with that, but it's, it's the, the difference between reading you know, the comments 
section in Breitbart versus reading the Times. You know, it's the two different publications. If you understand what and they're presenting, then you know what they're, they're yeah. giving you. It's, it's, it's a whole different skill set. Um, and I, like, I, I love, you know, when people talk about whiskey, but I don't try and make whiskey. I'm not a distiller. I would never be a distiller. Mm. I don't have that skill set. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely an element that I, what I loved about Scotch whiskey was it was journalists writing about whiskey rather than whiskey lovers writing about whiskey. Um, but yeah, um, before, before I, uh, I get uh, both Marion and Andy, your, your comments on this one, I just want to bring out is caststrength.net. Uh, which is now well defunct, but Joel Ridley, uh, sorry, Neil Ridley and Joel Harrison, who um, came from A&R in, in music in the UK, I love the way they used words to pull together. Now they write a lot of books um, and I think their gin book is coming out soon. I haven't seen it in Australia, but that'll be excellent. But um, yeah, Andy and Mary, it, like, what, what, are, what are your ref, go-to references online? I have to say I use scotchwhiskey.com. Actually, I was uh, having a, a mental laugh because I remember the first day I joined this company and I came up to Sterling to work and I sat down at my desk. Uh, the first thing I did was go on scotchwhiskey.com and, and look for iron whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, actually, you know, that's any, you know, up to date, you know, it, complete history and information of the distillery and I thought you know we did have obviously files and books and everything else and obviously I got to learn you know by by doing but uh, I remember the first day the very first day I just opened scotchwc.com and tried to learn as much as possible from the website so I still use it to this day like I still you know go and look for absolutely anything unless it's something very specific so I try to find someone that works for the company and ask them you know directly but uh, apart from that it's uh, I still use them yeah I think it's it's the only cause of like where they I, I'm biased because I, I sat and watched them set up that you know the, the editorial team for Scotch Whiskey sat opposite me in, in the office so I know them well and I, you know, uh, they are good friends. But even before this, the website went live, we hired various freelance uh, writers. Um, and so they, you know, the, the amount of people that came through our office that, that were just, you know, exceptionally educated and knowledgeable. And they were tasked to sit there and research and learn and educate. And they did nothing but research, 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 right. And so mm. it wasn't a case of like, oh, you know, let's just get some brand reps to chuck up the information. This is like, let's ask the brand team of McAllen, please let us know about the history of your distillery. You know, and the brand team of Edgedow, please, please let us know. It was like independent authoritative writing that had no marketing bias whatsoever, no spiel, no no literature was passed from, from one to the other. And it was all his fact, 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 fact. Um, and that's why I love it. It's it's just, there's, there's no bullshit. It's just pure, this is truth. And if we yep. can't find it as truth, then we won't put it down. You, you, you're breaking my heart. You're breaking my heart. I, what I, because my little project that's been going for like five years now, I've realized is my model train set. So back when I lived, when I had more space, I had a little N scale model train set. And when you have model trains, you know, as you all never, do, of course. Yeah, as you all do, it's never finished, right? You keep tinkering away and then you decide halfway through, it was like, oh, that's no, we're going to do country Victoria instead of country New South Wales this time. And this little project is my train set. Sure. Every, t every time I go, this, it's almost finished, it's like, I know, let's, let's, let's rip it up. Let's do it again. It's got to be something different. Um, but maybe maybe I should actually do that and uh, get it sorted and finish it. I think I should just I just want to do two honourable mentions in terms of website and books, actually. Um, Whiskey Base, I don't know if you ever use it, but I do use it mm. a lot. But it's more like to find out, you know, maybe old bottling and things like that. But I, I do absolutely love uh, the yeah. website. And just, ignore the just, just ignore their scoring. Yeah. Just ignore the... Yeah. Is I, 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 think it's, the I think it's a good gauge of consumer opinion. Like, I, I, if if we're looking at it from a what do people think of this, I find it a good. You have to understand the market with a pinch of salt and understand the product and the people. But if you understand the people that are writing the reviews and then their feedback, it gives you a good idea of. But I, you, you you're not. It, it's a it's a certain customer. Um, it's a very look. It's a very niche. It's it's. Uh, but I agree with Mariella. It's 
it's a good resource uh, for finding old bottlings and for. Mm. I don't trust the and school also, these things. Yeah. In terms of books, I remember, unfortunately, I don't have it anymore, but I remember the Whiskey Exchange. I don't know if you remember, Andy. We used to have it a lot. It was called the uh, uh, Misaka Udo, the Scotch, the Scotch Whiskey Distilleries. I don't know if you remember. It was a purple book. I don't know if you've ever seen that. But if you're into geeky, old, lost, you know, books, uh, like distilleries, and you want to find out more about that side of, you know, the past of the whiskey industry, that's a very good book too. I remember I used to go for fun just to check all the whiskey distilleries that were in Campbelltown and when they closed just for fun. And it was very, very good, very detailed. It was, was that the, the closed distilleries of Campbelltown book? It's got the closest I mean, it wasn't Campbell just Campbelltown. It was the whole. It was the whole of Scotland. It was this Scotch whiskey distilleries, but uh, it's a great. Book. I, I, I love it. There's a oh, book that's the yes, closest distilleries. Yes, I love that book. I've got it in storage. Oh, I've been looking one, yeah. for it. It's in a box somewhere. I've found it's it. It's called the. It's just. It's not the closed. It says the distilleries of Campbelltown, the rise and fall of the whiskey world. It's actually <laughs> before, written by, before they closed. Yeah, well, yeah. This, this one was written by David Sturk, from who used to run Creative Whiskey Company. Oh and wow. He, and he um and he 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 doesn't have I don't think he's involved with that anymore these days. But he um well, creative whiskey companies what's, now. What's he doing now? Because yeah, no. I, I, oh, I, I keep up, up, up with him on, on social media, but I, I'm not sure really what he's doing at the moment. But I'm sure he's keeping himself busy with a few things. So big shout out, David. I, I, um, saw, I, I, I enjoyed reading. I think he posted someone else's article on yeah. I mean, uh, we fraudulence in our industry. Uh, yeah, no, he 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 yeah he does love it's that. Fu- it's, it's funny actually because I. I had come across that the person that this article was about, I'd come across them just recently through other means. And I looked at it and I, I looked at their website and looked at their videos and just thought, I think actually Matt, I told you about this. And mm-hmm. I looked at it and just went, doesn't, doesn't it right? Looks dodged. Not sure. Yeah. yeah. Not convinced. I, it yeah. made me chuckle reading the, I, it was a long article, but I read it all yesterday and just went, ah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah there it is. Um, Cool. Well, no, that was. A... There is another book if I can recommend. I'm sorry, I'm doing all the recommendations last minute. But if you're into, <laughs> if you're into, uh, you know, interesting, funny, weird, and you know, terror stories of you know illegal distillation and everything that comes with it, you know, families shooting each other and people dying at sea and stuff like that. Uh, there is a great book um, actually about Aaron because we didn't have a distillery for so long, so not a lot of people actually know about it. But Aaron was big in illegal distillation in like, you know, 17th, 18th century. And um, uh, um, uh, they just released a book, I think, last year called Aaron Water, which was the name of the illegal whiskey at the time. So if you would like to read something about Aaron as well, at the end of the day, Campbellton and Aaron are just there. The illegal stills that they were used, you know, on uh, on Aaron in those days were made in Campbellton by, uh, mm. by a guy. We still have the record, so you can still see all of the stills that he sent illegally to Aaron to make illegal whiskey. So if you want to tie up all the things, you know, together and read the Campbellton and Aaron book, I really recommend it. It's a very good book. It's called The Aaron Water. So very nice and easy to remember. Very cool. I'm done with books I'm, recommendations. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a, before we all descend into madness, I give a quick plug and a big thank you to, to Mariella. Because yeah, um, we've, we've talked a lot about Aaron. Um, and Aaron in Australia has been through a, a few different phases in terms of like its approach into the country. It, it was very small. It was very big. It got very small again. Um, so it's in a lot of pockets and a lot of bars um, around the country. Uh, if you want to, if, if you work in the trade and you want to talk to someone about Aaron, it's called the Spirits Company. Um, probably Liam can help you out there. Um, if you're a consumer and, you know, the Oak Barrel can't afford to keep all the Aaron skews at all times. So there's a website called thewhiskeycompany.com.au. Um, you can probably find every Aaron available in Australia. You, you can go to that website and, and see what's available and what's brought in at the moment. So, um that's just a quick plug because Mariella, you know, so you didn't have to do it and feel like you were coming over the top of other retailers. I'll do that one for you. Um, Thanks. But- it, was, it, was, it was a really funny one because I, the company I work with used to distribute Aaron. And I think the the same month that I found out that you joined, I was ready to call you up and say, hey, we're working together again after all these years. We uh, announced that we were changing uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, no, but that's all. 
Uh, we were not anymore, not anymore. <laughs> no, but I, I loved my time in Australia. Let's see, it was the first time, and uh, I mean, Liam and the whole company they did an amazing job. And we have, you know, we had such great events, even with you, Scott. I really enjoyed it, and uh, I loved the country as well. It was great. So I'm looking forward to come back and, you know, do more events, you know, and more tastings, or do them virtually. You'll never know. Uh, but uh, that I'll said, come back. thank you. Don't worry about the tastings. Fine. Yeah, it's fine. That said, I just want to say thank you all to have me uh, for having me today and to allow me to to speak all of my degree out. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's been great. And uh, uh, on behalf of all the society members who got to ask cool questions and tune in tonight, um, thank you so much for being a part of it. As always, yeah. cool. It's it's just just re really special to you know because we see you what once in like in millennia. You've only been here once in you know this this millennium. And then, um, you know, <laughs> maybe it's going to be a whole other millennium, uh, you know, that you, you'll come, come back again. So the yeah, Aaron like millennium taste, the Aaron, yeah. Aaron millennial tasting. It's, uh, it's, it's a big one. I, I feel like okay, this is a we'll bit do of... a special cast and the millennial cast and we'll just yeah. use it, we'll use it especially for these events. Yeah, and just, just a tiny in a comment to the millennium cast, we apparently <laughs> only need to dress as eagles. Might yeah, be in joke between someone and you. I made this joke with Liam as well. <laughs> have you seen, have you seen, uh, have you ever seen Always Sunny? I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, the TV show. No? I know of it. I know of it. Yeah, yeah. Guys, what are you doing with your lives? Why didn't you see that show? It's brilliant. Reading, reading it's books extreme. by Michael Jackson. And it's a stop, <laughs> stop reading and tr the books. I listen to, I watch yeah. British comedy. I, <laughs> True. Why? Yeah. I don't, well, anyway. Lord. So, Anyway, there are some guys dressed up as, as eagles. It's all about, you know, being American and everything. But yes, we're going to dress up all like eagles. And um, and yeah, so that's it. We all dress up like eagles. We release this cask and we'll send it around the world. Let's do it. No, I, I love it. And if, if there is anyone in, in the comment thread on, on anywhere that um, is interested in getting in touch from a, from a retail or wholesale or whatever, just wants to know a little bit more about Aaron, hit up myself or Matt and we, we can point you in the right direction uh, to Thank Liam or that. Craig or whoever that is. Yeah. Um, but I'm not but, um, fine. Fine. Me neither. No, don't worry about Andy. That's enough, mate. That's enough. Here yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Pinnacle had to go. Now, before, can we just, before we go, quickly, everyone's favourite Aaron ever. Da -da. You got it. Was, it was actually... Three seconds yeah, to decide. Yeah, it was Ben Soshan who brought along that 18-year-old at one of our guild sessions. And it was a it was a sherry cask day hand rolled and it was a banger. There you go. That's my answer. Okay, I need to think of a nif different one then, because um, the that was also my favourite one. The was eighteen it? the eighteen year old, because I've converted more people to whiskey with that whiskey alone than any other whiskey ever. Wow. Um. On on that point, I'm going to switch to like the original Aaron uh, podcast that came into the country. You know the old in in the old tins and the first ones. That came yeah, through. yeah. So we're not this important, but the previous important important before that, um, because we used to run a company called Dram Club, and at fifty percent, that like sweet, delicious working with a sweet um, Aaron New Make was just a game changer for what people thought whiskey could be. Yeah. Um, and so I thought it was excellent. <coughs> also, um, Mary, you've done well there. There's one more Kindle purchase of the Aaron Water um, already uh, from your comments. Thank you very there. much. So, yeah, I hope you're getting a commission. <laughs> uh, but, but I said, Mary, I said, I'll give you some lag you make when I come next. Yeah. Uh, no, that wasn't, wasn't me. It was Mark Gordon, but I'll take the lag you make. Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, just finally, your, your favorite, Aaron. Uh, it's uh, Aaron Quirikas Boffy Batch number uh, four. Uh, which is the whiskey that I tried last year when I joined the company in January that made me realize that I did a good choice in joining the company. <laughs> I, was like, I tried all of them and I was like, okay, this is nice. It's fresh and fruity and tasty. And then I had that one. I was like, yeah, that's it. I come in. Like, you know, that, that makes my, <laughs> love that makes, you know, like, all of my efforts. Good. Exactly. Yeah. That makes my life make sense again. You know, this job is amazing. I love it. And, you know, and it just changed, you know, it just convinced me even more that uh, I did a very good choice. Amazing. Thank you very much, mate. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining in for all the questions and the comments. And thank you guys for having me today. Yeah, you know, thanks, it's very, Harry. very hard to drink at midday. We, we appreciate your efforts. <laughs> it was only 63.5%. It's absolutely fine. <laughs>
Uh, no, this is good. I've, like, I, we, we're done early enough so I can go to Rover now. So if anyone's in Sydney. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope I'll see you soon. Cheers. Stay safe. Bye.